Well, so if I wasn't nervous enough already, uh, now I have to watch my English. <laughs> so now I have to talk about really technical stuff in English uh, uh, in this awesome place. Uh, thanks very much to Boris for inviting me. This is so cool. I came in and I was like, um, can, I get a, can I get some water somewhere? And everyone was like, no, we've just got beer. <laughs> There's the fridge. So I don't know whose water bottle I stole, uh, but thank you. Uh, I'll be drinking beer afterwards, if that's right. OK, so um, as um, Boris said, uh, we have a hackathon on Friday at Basin. Uh, you guys are all invited, and you should all come. So instead of uh, talking about what I'm going to talk about there, uh, instead, I thought I'd come and talk to you about something um, that is hopefully useful for you guys as you build technical companies. And uh, what I landed on was how Facebook builds Facebook. So that's what um, I was going to talk about. But um, just in case you can't make it on Friday, I just thought I'd do a little plug um, for, for, the, for the technology and all that kind of stuff. So bear with me. Uh, how many of you are building consumer-facing startups? Okay, like a good half of you. How many of you building mobile startups? Okay, even less. Okay, given that, let me just say that if you are building some kind of consumer facing startup, like you should totally be considering Facebook in your stack. And I don't mean Facebook apps in inverted commas. I mean embedding Facebook into your app on every platform. And so instead of like going on about this for ages, I just thought I'd show you one video, which is a minute and a half long, but tells you more about this than I ever could. Okay? Try this. Do you need sound? No, no sound. This is two iPhones, and there is no like sequences shortened here. On the right hand side, we have an iPhone, uh, an, uh, this guy using an app. He's going to invite his friend to use this app, right? And it doesn't have to be an invite, you could just publish a story. But if you send an invite, the guy on the left, is going to get a push notification from Facebook. He's going to swipe it. Now we know his password. <laughs> That's going to appear in the notifications jewel. He's going to tap it. And he's going to end up at the App Store to download that app. And this flow works regardless of what platform the two guys are on. This guy could be on the web or using Android. And this guy could be using iOS. So he's got the app, he's installed it, he's logged in with Facebook. He waits here for some inordinate amount of time, probably to read this beautiful permissions dialog. And he's going to click login, agree to the permissions, and now he's using the app. So think about what happened there. That was a minute and a half. And in that time, this dude, who'd never heard of this app before, got a push notification, installed it, and is using it. And this guy is now playing this game with his friend. Think about how that works today, right, if you don't have this flow. Um, you see someone using an app. You ask them what it is. They tell you. You have to remember it. Then you try and search for it in the App Store. Then you hopefully find it and install it. Oh, hello. Uh, hopefully find it and install it. And um, you see it again. Uh, no, let's not do that again. <laughs> and then hopefully you find it and install it. And that one might take five minutes, and it may not even work, right? So if you're building a consumer startup, you should be doing this. In the last 30 days, people went through that flow 150 million times, which is a pretty big number. So there's a reason why eight of the top 10 iOS apps have integrated with this stuff. So sales pitch over. If you want to know more about how that works, Come on Friday. But that's all I wanted to say about like, Facebook's technology stack. So here is, uh, here's the details. Um, tinyroll.com slash fbhackwarsaw. Uh, it's at Basin. It's all day. Uh, you can arrive at 9. Um, talks start at 10. Then there's seven hours of hacking. And then you guys get a chance to show us what you built. Um, and the best hack from our four events in Europe will win a trip, yes, to San Francisco, hang out with Facebook. No? Not cool? <laughs> and an iPad! <laughs> oh, God. All right, tough crowd.
Okay, there you go. So, um, Salisbury Trophy, you, should, you guys uh, should totally come uh, on Friday. Apart from that, it's going to be an awesome day. So, yes, there will be beer. Um, it's the most important thing. In order, like good Wi Fi, very important, beer and pizza. That's basically the three things that we make sure each event has. So, we, we will have all those things. So, I uh, look forward to seeing you guys there. Okay. So let me tell you about me first, I guess. Um, I've been at Facebook for two years now. Um, I'm an engineer. Uh, I was the first guy Facebook hired in uh, Europe that commits code about two years ago. Um, so I went over to the States and did two months of boot camp. Um, and since then, I've been working on our platform. So um, timeline, open graph, all of that stuff. Basically, anything that we launched with when we launched timeline and open graph, like that was my and my team's work. So we work with people like SoundCloud, Spotify, Deezer, um, Onet, um, uh, Showroom, um, Isacini, Dailymotion, like uh, Mixcloud, a bunch of like cool European tech companies. So that's what I've been doing at Facebook for the last kind of uh, two years. I also spend most of my time uh, writing code for um, developer tools, SDKs, and sample apps, that kind of thing. Um, so this is how we build Facebook. And it's a pretty insane story, right? Because we are quite big. <laughs> like this massive scale, right? Over 955 million monthly users, which is an insane number. We operate at ludicrous speed. And like, when I say that, like, uh, we ship code every day to 955 million people. Um, and it just keeps getting faster and bigger. We have more people working for Facebook, and we have more users. And we're committing more code. So this is the graph of um, commits per month, uh, every month since 2006 to the start of this year. And it's just going up and up and up. So you'd think um, it would be a pretty tough deal to release that much code that often to that many people, and hopefully not have things break. So that's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> we have this magic ratio. It's a pretty crazy ratio, right? We roughly. <laughs> pretty crazy ratio. We have roughly a hundred, one engineer to every million users. So, like, as the number of users has grown, so the number of people at Facebook has grown. So you'd think we were done, right? We've got all these like people using Facebook like all the time. Like, by the way, half a billion of them use it every day, and half of the billion of them use it every month on mobile. So it's like insane, these numbers. So you think we were done. So why would we still release all this code every day? Because shipping code is dangerous. Things break all the time. Hopefully not, but sometimes they do. And the fundamental thing is the only thing more dangerous than change is not changing stuff. Like if you if your product seizes up and doesn't evolve and doesn't push forward, like you will fail. So the risk of changing stuff is vastly outweighed by the risk of not changing stuff. So how do you do it at this scale? And we found out it's basically about two things. And it's mostly about one. It's all about the culture. It's about the engineering culture in your company it's about how you think about change and about progress. But it also is a lot about tools. And so I'm going to run through some of the tools we have at Facebook that help us build this stuff, many of which we've open sourced. So here's how we thought about our build process, right? There are three things that we do not compromise on at Facebook as, as, as an engineer. The first one is ownership and impact. So when I started at Facebook, my first day and a half was like induction, like here's where the free food is, like here's your free laptop. I was like, yes. <laughs> and then halfway through Tuesday, they were like, right, here's your desk. I sat down on my desk, turned on my computer, and there were five emails waiting for me. First one said, welcome to Facebook, and the next four were tasks assigned to me. And my first task was to deal with the wrapping of text underneath a profile picture, right? Which you think sounds silly. And it kind of is, except that you think that, number one, this is people's names you're playing with. This is like their surname with a hyphen. And how that works in different languages is different. 
So this is a pretty scary thing that you don't want to screw up. And the second thing is it's on every single page on Facebook. So in a day, that piece of code is run something like 15 billion times. So when we talk about ownership and impact, I got that task on the Tuesday, I did it on the Wednesday, and I shipped it to production on Thursday. Three days. And I'm still responsible for that code. So uh, it get blames to me. So if it goes wrong, like, guess what? My phone's going to call. Phone's going to ring. So ownership and impact. Engineers at Facebook are responsible for their code from the moment they conceive it all the way through to commit, to release, to life cycle in production, right through to deprecation. And the impact is really important. The fact that I can release something like that to that many people that quickly is important to us. It's how we want our culture to be. The second is time from commit to production. As I just said, it can be as short as half an hour if I need it to be. But I'll say this again later. The maximum time between commit and production is nine days. Maximum. Like I cannot make it any, sl uh, any, fa uh, any slower than that. Can I make it any faster than that? Any longer than that. Thank you. See, my English is rubbish. <laughs> Thanks. I could speak nothing else. I'd be really screwed. Um, and the third thing is the time taken to deploy the site. So the fact that, you know, when something goes wrong, you need to be able to fix it really quickly. Like, that is extremely important to us. Like, just in case. We should never need that, but we want that to be there in case we do. All right, so these are the three things that we care about when we're optimizing our development process. So here was the first thing I found when I got to Facebook that scared the living daylights out of me. The web tier is one code base. So you literally turn up and you go basically like, get clone, Facebook. <laughs> okay, here it comes. So what I mean here is like, I mean the web tier, right? So I don't mean our services, things like the ads algorithm boxes and the systems that run newsfeed uh, and all the back end stuff. I mean like what you hit when your web server hits Facebook. But that is the vast majority of what Facebook is. It's our APIs, it's our developer site, it's Facebook. So it exists in a single web tier. And many of you, and I've worked at big companies before, I used to work at the BBC, and before that I used to work at a couple of smaller companies. Um, and the way bigger companies try and solve this like, huge team engineering problem is to cut everything up into little pieces. And you know what? That th feels like a good idea. Because suddenly you can like, understand that this team is working, this team is working. But actually, it totally sucks. Totally sucks. And I didn't realize it until I had this. And the reason it sucks is because the minute you need something changed in somebody else's code base, you have to ask them for permission. And that sucks. Number one, I have to ask them. Number two, they have to agree to it. <laughs> Number three, they have to not tell me to go away. Number four, if they agree to do it, they have to do it on my schedule. Number five, they then have to release it about the same time as me. That sucks. If you think about those three things, this, that process would cripple those three things. Like, I would not have been able to push that piece of code if it needed to change somewhere else. So this, don't get me wrong, has disadvantages. But it has massive advantages too. If I'm doing like a diff for, for like this feature, and it, find, uh, it turns out that I need one line changed in this far away piece of code, I can just do it. And yes, that means that like other people can change your code, but like build systems to alert you of that rather than forcing your developers to work a certain way. So we'll go through that in a bit. Anyway, that's pretty scary. Yes. Say again? I don't know what the ratio is, but I'll go through the, um, not really in the code, but um, I'll show you in a minute how that actually works. Okay, so this is how it actually works. This is what my daily life at Facebook as an engineer is like. Okay, so here is Trunk, and Trunk is Facebook. No feature branches, no like modular stuff. The web tier is Trunk. So I, um, there's people committing to Trunk the whole time. So at some point, I create a local branch from Trunk, and that sits on my local machine, and that is currently Git. Our Trunk is right now subversion, but um, we are transitioning to Git for everything. So then on my machine, I have a local copy of Facebook, and I can locally commit my changes as I go. So I get to a point where I'm like, 
um, continuing. But people are always committing code to trunk. I need to rebase regularly to make sure those changes end up on my local repository. Is this, like, is this all right? Is this good knowledge? I know it's quite techy. OK, good. He likes. <laughs> the rest of you, sorry. Why are you, we're not using Git? Well, I'll repeat the question because it's easier. Why are we not using Git all over? Uh, we just haven't got there yet. Uh, Git is awesome, and we were going to use it more. Uh, historically, we just have SVN in trunk, um, and then like we have a Git SVN bridge between the two. But we're moving to Git for that. This is uh, we started five years. We started eight years ago, and this is eight years old. You can go back to this subversion repository to the first commit of Facebook eight years ago. It's pretty cool. Uh, I haven't. That's not what my Friday afternoons are. You know, just sitting looking at the old days. Anyway, uh, don't know. <laughs> Couldn't possibly comment. Um, so at this point, like we have tests that run on my local machine to like make sure that what I'm doing is good, and these tests know that the code, what the code I've changed, and work out which tests need to run on that chain that code that's changed. So then here comes the key part. The only thing between me, the developer. And 955 million people is one code review. Right? This is how we do it. But everything, one line, one space, one character, has to be code review. So I submit the, my diff for code review, and then um, some friendly engineering manager says, hello, that was awesome. That doesn't always happen. Often there's like a bit more cyclical stuff in here. But let's just deal with it. So let's assume the reviewer says, yeah, awesome, this code is great. At that point, we have a special switch that unlocks the ability for me to commit that diff up to trunk. But first, I have to rebase again to make sure no one has changed anything before I do it. And then as soon as that is OK and I've resolved any conflicts, up goes my commit. And less than nine days later, that code will be on production. Like, and there's nothing I can do about it. It's going out. So the way we do this is with a suite of tools that we built in-house to make this workflow possible. Um, and we open source them. Here they are. Uh, Fabricator.org is where like, uh, they live. The guy that worked at Facebook who wrote this stuff now like, left Facebook and writes this stuff full time. So um, Herald is the tool that notifies you when somebody else is changing your code. So you know what I was saying? Like, we divvy up, you know, in most companies, you divvy up the code so that this is ours and you can't touch it. With Facebook, it's one code base. So someone can touch my code, but this helps me understand who's changing it and what they do. Manifest is a task system that we don't actually use, but we might um, <laughs> one day. It's actually based on ours, but we, we have our own internal one. Um, but the two bits that are killer are differential and diffusion. So this stuff is written in PHP, but it sits on top of Git, Mercurial, or Subversion. So you can like run this stuff and use it. Diffusion is a code browser, but it's pretty. And because it knows about the code repository and it knows about the changes made to it, then the code browsing is amazing. I can highlight a line of code and see everybody who's ever touched it. So if I'm finding a problem, it's quite easy to find out who I need to go and speak to. So again, it's a great way having a single code base to find out what's going on. But the killer one is differential. If you use GitHub for code reviews, like this is kind of the same thing, but it is awesome. Uh, and let me show you for why. So this is a task. Uh, this is a Fabricator's differential. Um, this wasn't actually one of my tasks. But basically, at the top, uh, there's all the information you need about whether or not this task, uh, who's, who's in control of it, what it is. It links to the tasks. And then we can see um, the people commenting on it. Uh, we can also see the entire revision history. Further down. I can actually browse the code base and see all the changes that are being made. Um, and I can comment in line. So I mean, you guys have probably seen this stuff in like most modern code repository systems. Um, you can comment in line. You can do all the good stuff. The cool thing about this is how closely it is tied into that workflow I was talking about earlier. So let me explain that a little bit later. Fabricator is awesome. But hang on a second. We're building Facebook, which is like quite a big website, or quite a big like product now, because this code base I'm talking about, the the, the mobile, uh, the um, the web code base, is the code base from which we serve m.facebook.com, 
And we have more traffic to m.facebook.com than we have to our iOS and our Android apps combined. Also, the iOS app and the Android app talk to this code base for all of their data, for everything. So this is the front end to Facebook for everything. This process, this stack is important to us. So hang on a second. There's like lots of engineers building lots of code, and they're all committing it to trunk. And it's going to be launched in under nine days. So how do we build features? How do you build something like Timeline? Well, most people, or some companies, the way they do it is they write the feature in a feature branch, they test it on another set of servers, and then when it's ready, they merge it into trunk and deploy it. And if it's on their production servers, that's it. It is visible to your users. And that's a bit coarse. What if you want to do something a bit more granular? Another major issue with that is you only get to test this product on some test servers over here. So the way we solve this problem is through feature switching. How many of you guys work on products with feature switching built in? One, two, OK. Feature switching is killer. So most companies, right, when you think about feature switching, what it means is the code is in the code base. And then we disable or enable access to this code based on some flags. And at some companies, you can do that by A-B testing. At some companies, you can turn it on for subset of your users. At Facebook, we have a tool called Gatekeeper. And if I was doing a startup today, the one thing I'd want with me is Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper is fe feature switching on steroids. So here's how it works. When I write code, if I'm building something new, I wrap it in a conditional. At the top, it just says if gatekeeper check, and then the name of the gatekeeper check. And then here's the code. Else, run this other code that's normal and old. Or don't. That means that we can build a feature, something as small as a button or a language change, or something as large as Timeline, and put it behind a gatekeeper, and then control who sees it. I was using Timeline as my real Facebook profile a year before it was launched. And that's because there was a gatekeeper called Timeline. And then in here was who gets to see it. So the way it typically works is I build a feature. I wrap it in a gatekeeper. Um, I then push that code into production. Being gatekeeper, it's only visible to me. So that code is in production. It's on the real servers that the real users are hitting. But it only works for me. At the point at which it's ready for other people to use, then I add my team members in here. And suddenly, they all get it. And they don't get it on some test servers over here. They get it in their real Facebook at home, at work, everywhere. So they're really using the feature. No test servers, the real Facebook. This stuff is so granular, so, so then I might launch it to the whole company. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Yes? Um, Hello. Okay. Uh, so do you do any test features, or it's always uh, wrapped into gatekeeper? Most things are wrapped in a gatekeeper. Test environment? Say again? Do you have any test environment? Yeah, we do have test environments. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about those in a bit. But what I'm trying to explain with gatekeeper is this solves the like, splitting up of your code base problem. Right? Most people split up their code base because they want control over releasing different features at different times. Gatekeeper does this for you and lets you have a single code base that makes one person change any bit of the code, which is absolutely awesome. So then I can choose to launch it to a woman in Guatemala who uses Chrome, who's been on Facebook for more than two years, who has over 50 friends, who's using Windows, and zero to 100% of that group. So that is how you can launch features to 955 plus million users without having to do a release to yourself without there and use Gatekeeper to control who sees it. It is like killer for how you can build a product quickly and that changes every day. So when I say we release, release code every day, like the actual product is changing way more regularly because we're just like controlling the dials behind the scenes. This is awesome. Is, is this profiling done online, like on, on request, or uh, do you compare like data from user profiles? It's, it's done in real time, yeah. It's done in real time. So like, uh, your Facebook could change one minute because this has changed, like all in real time. 
So some crazy stuff that un goes underneath to actually make that happen, but which I won't go into. Yeah, go on. Just one question about um, when you roll out the new functions, uh, and I'm aware that there's a lot of master servers and mirror servers that serve all the content to everyone. And so what is the time frame, the maximum time frame when in the future starts being public for someone, somewhere, and to the, to the person that is the last one that gets the function public? What is the time frame? Uh, you mean, do you mean technically or do you mean like in the terms of a product launch? Yeah, so the, the question was like, how long does it take for the first person to get it for the last person to get it? And yeah. um, I guess there's two answers to that. Um, the first answer is um, technically, like as, as quickly as we want it to happen, right? Like I turn the dials and then like it takes a while for that configuration to propagate to all the servers, but once it's on all the servers, everyone gets it instantly. The second part of the question is as a product, how quickly do we roll out products? Um, and the other major benefit of this is it means we can build four versions of something, three versions of something, 10 versions of something, and give like 20% of the world that version, 20% that version, monitor those versions performance over time, deprecate the worst one, and then spread the remaining four across everyone? Huh? Uh, we're testing different things. Yeah, yeah, we're A-B testing stuff. We're A-B testing stuff. Like, if you're not A-B testing stuff, like, your startup's going to fail. Live testing is better than online testing. Yeah, like, like and so if you think, if, we, if I dial that up to 1%, right, that is billions of requests. That 1% is billions of requests. So we have, like, we can dial a feature up to 1% of the user base or 1% of people in a country and, like, get really meaningful data about how it performs technically in terms of, like, performance or the graphs, servers, are they happy, are they blowing up? But also, like, does it perform as a product, right? And if you guys aren't doing this today, like, you need to be. And there's tons of frameworks to make it available. Anyway, I'm going on too long and there's a ton more stuff to get through. Is this all right? Yes. Okay, good. Good. So that is, like the process from like idea to build to commit to kind of production so i want to talk about how we actually push the code to like 955 million users so the first question is when do we push the answer is all every day every single work day and in fact now we have an engineering office in london we're going to be pushing twice a day we have more people in more places and we're speeding up not slowing down. So here's how it works. Tuesday is the big day. And how many of you guys integrate with Facebook in your products? 100%. Okay, good. Good. It's a very powerful platform for growing apps, <laughs> as I said before. But you know, you want to find out about that? Come on Friday. Uh, Tuesday is the big day. And what I'll explain in a minute is why you should care. So when I said um, the code that you commit, the longest is nine days is because on Tuesday, we push trunk. Like, if your code's in trunk, on Tuesday, it's gonna go live. If you want your code to be on production faster than that, then you have to request it in one of the daily purges, daily uh, pushes. So Wednesday is basically everything we broke on Tuesday. Thursday is a normal day. There's no other normal days. Friday, don't break anything because we're going home for beer. Monday, it's small because the big one's the next day and Tuesday's the big day. So that's like how we release during the week. So let me explain what we mean by trunk and Tuesday. Here's how it works. It's on Sunday, uh, about half past six, a cron job takes a cut of trunk and that is put onto a branch called latest. When I said we have no branching, we have one and it's called latest and that's it. Uh, and that code is then pushed onto the latest production, the latest tier. And it sits there until Tuesday at 4 p.m., at which point it goes live, and whatever was on the production servers just goes into the bin. So there's this window between Sunday 6 p.m. and Tuesday where there's this other code that's about to go live that isn't live yet, and everyone else in the world is using truck. So when I say nine days, what I mean is, if you commit at 7 p.m. on Sunday, then you have to wait Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday before you get cut, before you go into production on Tuesday. So that's where the nine days comes from. So, well, so it's, it's a week plus two days. And this is two days because, as I'll explain in a minute, so well, what I mean is, uh, 
Well, what I mean is we discover two days is enough for us to like take a, a temperature check of what we've made and then fix it before we push it. It's just the cadence of what we have. So I'll explain that now. What is latest? So on Sunday, latest equals trunk. But every day that goes by, latest is trunk, as it was on Sunday, plus anything that people want merged. So why do we do this? We do it because if you're inside Facebook's corporate network, you, as staff, use latest. That's what I get when I use Facebook in the office. Which means, on a, on a Monday and a Tuesday, I'm using the version of Facebook that the world is going to get on Tuesday evening. So what that means is it's two days. And we make it ridiculously easy for employees to file bucks. So if you're an employee, this is what Facebook looks like to you. Down in the bottom right corner, there's a little nub. And that nub tells you the build ID, when it was built, and links through to all of the changes that are in that build. And then there's a little bug bug. Uh, and I click on it. And then I have this really intuitive uh, bug reporting flow. So number one, it works out which part of Facebook I'm on and tries to find other tasks that people may have already reported. I can take a screenshot, I can categorize it, and I can submit it. And we have a whole team who sit there and wait for these to come in. And that's because while we do a ton of automated testing before we commit to Trunk, employees are the first human testers. They catch tons of great stuff. On a Monday and a Tuesday, this is what we look at, and these are what we fix. So those two days give us the chance to discover this stuff before we unleash it on the unsuspecting world. So that is what latest is about. So if you're the public, www.facebook.com, you get internally www.prod.facebook.com. This is a separate set of stateless web servers. It's the same production databases, same caches, all that kind of stuff, but it's a different front end. When I say web tier, it's a stateless tier, right? There's no state persisted in the web tier. Uh, if you're an employee, you get latest. So I asked you why you should care. And that's because you can have that too. We built beta.facebook.com. And so if you hit www.beta.facebook.com, you're hitting the code base that we're going to release either in two days or tomorrow. And that is not just www.beta, it's apps.beta.facebook.com, graph.beta.facebook.com, m.beta.facebook.com. Any part of Facebook, you can access the latest version, right? So if you're building, like logging with Facebook into your website or into your mobile apps, or into, uh, you know, say you're building an app inside our Chrome, on a Monday and a Tuesday, test this. So you may discover stuff that actually we notice and fix by Tuesday, but you may also discover stuff that we haven't discovered ourselves. And if you submit a bug to our bug system on a Monday or a Tuesday and tag it with beta, we jump on it and fix it before we employ this fix, uh, break the world. Just a small question. I face the problem every day. This, what I do is Facebook apps, which are automatic, and it's what my business is. And uh, actually, what is the channel to contact you when we discover the bugs that we do every day? Developers.facebook.com slash bugs. Just use that. Do it. It does work. If it doesn't work, make like it works. It doesn't work, and we're doing it like for half year right now, and none of the requests were answered at all. And they were really wise and smart, and they did the stuff. That of course, they were. It's true. Like, so I, it, it's a difficult. There's there's a lot going on on the platform, right? And we have a small team. So the. Okay, so we can, we can talk about this offline, but like the, the answer is developers.facebook.com slash bugs, and if that doesn't work for you, I'll make it work for you. If you go through some other channel, somebody else with that problem ain't gonna, fi ain't gonna find out. So we'll fix it. We have to fix it. So, what's the maximum time from commit to production? As I said earlier, it's nine days. Six more minutes before pizza. Wow, okay, God, time for questions. All right. So this is the cool bit. I think this is one of the cool bits. So you know I said you can request code to be pushed more regularly, quicker? This is how you do it. So our push team are releasing millions of lines of code to millions of people every day, as I said before. They want to make sure they're not screwing something up. How do they know? Well, they don't. 
They trust the engineers. They have to trust the engineers. But they need to know how bad this is. How contentious is this issue? So going back to fabricator and differential, the pusher sees these two things here. He gives you a graph of the size of this change, number of lines and number of paths changed, and also how, many, how contentious was this, how many revisions were needed, how many comments were made in the bug review tool. Now this is relative to everything else that's being merged today. So he can tell immediately that this is not particularly risky. It could be a change to the logo, but like, you know, which would be risky, but let's just assume that means it's fine. It's like an MMO game working on Yes. Well, it gets worse. So the pusher, the, the guys in the push team, they see something extra. They see this. Everyone at Facebook is born with four stars. And if you request a merge and it conflicts or you break something, the pusher is going to take you down to three. And this stuff is built into the business logic of how we build code, right? If you get down to two stars, you can't request a daily merge anymore. So it's responsibility for like, how stuff works. Um, the guy that works on this, um, this is the poor man's version of like, somebody else's talk. Who's, you should watch this talk online. He does a much better ver version of it than me. He says, um, you see that thumbs up button? Doesn't know what it does. Never touched it. Yeah, so everyone's born with four stars and you can only go down. And I guess you can encapsulate this whole process, everything I've just talked about in one slightly cheesy Spider-Man phrase. Uh, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And I guess that's how we, um, we build stuff at Facebook. So last two things I want to talk about. Um, we have this tool called PerfLab. So the, not only do we have Gatekeeper and all of those releasing tools, the release engineers need to know if this change broke something. Not just a feature or the user, but it breaks, did it break like performance? And so what we have here is a pretty scary like, graph, but I'll talk you through it. First, I want to get this right, the yellow line is the performance of trunk. Every dot on here is a commit to subversion. And every commit, we have a whole test suite, a whole test tier that runs a bunch of automated tests on really important parts of Facebook. So yellow is uh, trunk, light blue is production, and the dark blue is the delta between the performance of the two. So what this shows is that a dude checked in some code, and he made trunk worse than production. Right? This is bad, because he made something worse. But right now it's OK, because it hasn't been released yet. So the good news is, he noticed this, or he was alerted to this, and he fixed it by committing another diff. And because this blue line is below the zero, he actually did a good job. He fixed it and made it better than it was before. But the bad news is, he missed the cutoff. He didn't get his code in before the, the cut on Sunday night. So we pushed this bad code. And now production is worse than trunk. And this is a bad position to be in. Stressful, Stressful job. So what happened here is uh, he very quickly requested a merge, and we fixed it. But the power of this tool means that we can make these changes extremely regularly and find out if it affects Facebook. Next tool, Test Console. We can see all of these tests that are running and whether or not they work and whether or not they break. If your test fails, you get an email about it, you have to fix it. So the very last thing I want to talk about is um, how we actually like, release this code to production. We don't ship PHP anymore. We transform PHP into C++, then we compile it, and then we ship a binary, and we run the binary on the servers. That binary is about one and a half gigs, and it is Facebook. It's the server, it's the static assets, it's the code base, it's the, co it's the text, it's everything. That is what Facebook is. And by doing it that way, we've got 50% performance boost, which saved thousands of pounds in servers, and tons and tons and tons of CO2, more importantly. We've been trying to make an app that does something like Friends Like Me thing. It uh, tries to kind of uh, compare all of the data of yourself and all the friends, and we've changed PHP to C++, and we gained 80% of customers. Same thing. 80%? When, okay. when comparing a lot of likes and a lot of things in per one profile. Sure. So uh, that is an, that's an important thing for us. But I'm just going to skip through this, because I've, I've gone on way too long, so I apologize. Uh, and we'll leave time for questions. Pieces arrived. So you probably Pieces arrived. 
Oh God, I already <laughs> shut up immediately. Okay, so in summary, uh, tools alone won't save you, uh, but they do help you move quicker than you could otherwise do, right? The thing that makes you move fast is your culture and your people. And that of everything we found at Facebook in eight years of building stuff extremely quickly is that this is the most important thing in your build and release process. So if you want more information on that, like as I said, this is a poor man's version of the guy who does this at Facebook did a talk. It's, the video is on facebook.com slash engineering. Uh, he does a, a much better job than I do. But um, instead of coming and talking to you about like, like why you should use Facebook, come and find out about that on Friday. I thought I'd come and talk about this kind of stuff. So um, hope, that, hope that was useful. Thank you very much. Can I have no, it's not that embarrassing, is it? Damn it. <laughs> Can I have one more question, like the last one before pizza? Yeah. Yeah, uh, okay. so Last question is I everybody who's speaking like as a person from Facebook have to look like uh, Mark Zuckerberg? No. <laughs> I, I don't get it, right? I don't get it. I don't get it. But I was, I was on the plane today, like writing the presentation. I had my headphones on. And uh, this 60-year-old um, woman from Wales tapped me on the shoulder and just said, excuse me, are you Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> no, I'm not Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, he, is, he is an awesome boss, though. Uh, he is an awesome boss.